Alice likes to think she's unique. Sure, she looks a little bit like her mom and a little bit like her dad and a little bit like her brother and sister. But when it comes down to it, no one else on earth is exactly like Alice. But not all organisms can say that. Some produce offspring by literally cloning themselves. They sprout a bud or scatter spores to the wind, and those little offspring grow up to be genetically identical to the parent. If humans did that, each person would be an exact genetic replica of their mom or dad. In fact, they'd only have one parent. Being able to create identical copies of yourself could come with some advantages. But when we look at organisms that use this reproductive strategy, like potatoes or bananas, we discover some significant drawbacks. In fact, there's a good chance that the banana you're familiar with, the Cavendish, might not be around much longer. I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. Today's lesson explores the two main strategies that organisms have for reproduction, sexual and asexual, and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Hello and welcome. I see the Hall family in Ottawa. Shout out to Colin and Viv watching from California, to Zahid and Anaya in New Jersey, Lindy and Solly in Maryland. It is so good to see everyone here. We are going to talk about reproduction today, a fascinating topic, but first I want to review real quick what we learned last time. Last time we talked about the biological concept of a species and that the definition we use most often is it's a group of individuals that can naturally breed and produce offspring. The ability to produce offspring is one of the defining characteristics of life. So for example, the pintail duck, we call a species of duck, and that means that it has its own scientific name. Right here, Anis ac acuta. And you can see that this duck has a blue bill, it has this white patch of feathers here and brown feathers on its head. It looks very different than the mallard duck. Ooh, so the mallard doesn't have that sharp pin tail. No, and it has a different scientific name, Anis platyrhynchosa. is how I would pronounce that. Sometimes scientific names can be a little difficult to pronounce. It has a green head, brown feathers on the front, and a yellow bill. Very different. So what is this. <laughs> it's got a green head, but a kind of a blue bill and kind of a pokey tail. And white and brown on the front, it's a pintail mallard hybrid. Mm. So scientists face questions like this all the time. You can see that these um, ducks, this one is a mix of the other two. And so should we call all three of these ducks and the pintail and the pintail mallard hybrid and the mallard are just variations of a duck? Or should we call these two different species? Or should they be three different species? These are the tricky questions that scientists get all the time when they're studying species. I'm gonna flip back, and when we looked at that first picture, I mean, those puppies are different looking. Some of them have dark fur, some of them have light, different spots, different colors. So this is a really good question. I would definitely call all of those the same species, but here with the ducks, it's not so cut and dry. And a recent example of this question about what a species is popped up in the news just last week. A person found an animal that needed help in Pennsylvania. It was sick with mange, which causes a lot of its fur to fall out. It was hungry and cold, and this person rescued it. But now that the animal is safe and being taken care of, people can't decide if it's a coyote or a dog. Ooh. And this is an important question to answer because if it's a coyote, then it goes to the wildlife center and they're gonna take care of it until it's strong enough to release it back to the wild. If it's a dog, it goes to the animal rescue center and will be taken care of until someone adopts it to live with a human family. But what if it's a hybrid? Oh man, okay. I'm. I'm... I'm on team coyote here. I think that's a coyote, but... Let us know what you think this animal is in the chat. It turns out that several experts couldn't tell by looking at the traits of the animal. So right now they're doing genetic testing to find out and it will be another week until we know the answer. But what do you think this is? 
And real quick review of that term we just heard, hybrid. A hybrid is when you have an animal that, or a plant, some organism that is a combination from two distinct species. And sometimes they'll use the term hybrid if it's just between two different varieties. Okay. And I'm seeing lots of votes for hybrid, some for coyote, some for dog, some for dogody, <laughs> or a koi dog. We'll find out in a few weeks. The two main types of reproduction are asexual, which means that clones are produced. They're genetically identical. And sexual reproduction, which means that there's genetic variation. And this is the type that is most often used by animals. So when a pair of birds breed, you don't get genetic clones of the parents. You get individuals that are different. So it's getting some genes from each parent. That's right. That's right. But the, the asexual reproduction produces just... clones. And I'm going to share just a couple examples of this because it's a pretty amazing reproductive strategy. So true story. I had a friend who had a weed called purslane growing in their garden. This is a plant you might recognize. It's a pretty cool plant because it's edible and it grows just about everywhere that humans do. It's a very hardy little weed that we have carried with us as we've traveled around the globe. And if you have it in your garden, one strategy for weeds is that you could just cut them up. And this is what my friend decided to try. They had this little tool that would till the ground and they thought, aha, I have several purslane in my garden. Instead of bending over and pulling them out, I'm just going to cut them up into little tiny pieces. Then those pieces will die and my garden won't have weeds. Take that purslane. Well, purslane is a master at something called vegetative propagation. And it turns out that if you cut up purslane, even just a piece of a leaf, can grow into an entire new <laughs> plant. So it rained after they tilled their garden, and the next week when they went to check on things, they didn't just have a couple purslane plants, they had hundreds. There were hundreds of purslane plants growing all throughout the garden because of this reproductive strategy. So they're vegetative. Help, helping the plants. That's right, vegetative propagation. And this is how bananas are grown. When we get bananas from the grocery store, these bananas come from a tropical plant and a flower that is pretty amazing. This is the banana flower. And you can see here are the tiny little bananas that are gonna grow and get bigger. And then they grow on these huge bunches that can weigh over a hundred pounds. Wow. But each banana tree, as they are sometimes called, each plant only produces one flower and then it's done. Oh. So as soon as it flowers, they chop off that top part, and then one of the little shoots from the ground down here will grow up and produce another banana tree with a banana flower. But that little shoot that grows up from the roots is genetically identical to the banana tree. And bananas are growing all throughout the tropics, and almost all of the varieties that you see are clones. So when you look at this aerial view of this banana plantation, all of those plants are genetically identical because they've been propagated or planted by gen vegetative propagation. And this works out well for us because wild bananas that grow in the jungle, a lot of those varieties have seeds. The uh -huh. bananas that you get in the store do not have seeds and they taste really good to us. So Ooh. that's why we propagate them this way. We want clones of the good bananas. Yes, we do because they taste great. And if you take that shoot that comes up from the roots and you plant it, then you always know what type of banana you're going to get. But this does have some drawbacks. In the 1950s, actually for almost a century, the main banana that was grown and that was produced and that you would find in the grocery stores was a variety named the Gros Michel or the Big Mike. And it didn't matter in the 1950s, it didn't matter whether you were at a store in Europe or a store in Florida or a store in Canada, any grocery store you went to, this is the variety of banana that they would have. But today you cannot find this variety of banana Ooh. because there was a fungal disease called the a wilt and it infected this banana variety and the banana variety started to die. But because they were all clones, all of them 
got sick. Wait, wait, they were, they were all susceptible because... They were genetically identical. Ooh. And so if one of them gets sick, then uh-oh, that means all of them can get sick. And right now the same thing is happening with the Cavendish banana, which is the type of banana that is most common in grocery stores today. It's starting to be affected by a, the same fungus and it's not resistant and banana growers are starting to panic a little bit and say, uh-oh, we really need to come up with a new variety that we can clone because this one is not going to be lasting too much longer. Save the bananas. Don't worry about that. There will be more bananas. People will come up with new clones because they are a very popular fruit. The same thing happens with potatoes. Most potatoes are clones. The best way to grow a potato is to take that tuber and cut it up because then you know what type of potato plant you're going to get. Potatoes do make flowers and seeds, but if you plant potatoes from seeds, you might get a potato plant that's totally different than the one you want. Mm -hmm. And planting potatoes from clones is fast and you know exactly what potato you're getting, but the disadvantage, can you guess? Well, it doesn't have genetic diversity, just like the bananas? Just like the bananas. And uh. this was a big problem in Ireland in the 1800s because the diet of most people was almost entirely potatoes. And so when all of the potatoes got sick at once, it caused an enormous famine. So the potato blight. Potato blight. Yeah. So, so far, Math Dad, we know that plants can be propagated by cloning. You can cut up certain plants and then put the pieces in the ground and you'll get new plants that are clones of the original plant. But, but animals can't do that, right? Well, let's consider a hypothetical. And write down your answer in the chat if you're watching live. If we found a new planet that was an ocean planet and it had lots of algae and small little plankton, but no animals in the ocean, and we planted one jellyfish into the ocean, would that one jellyfish live its entire rest of its life alone? Or would that one jellyfish reproduce and then you'd have an entire ocean full of jellyfish? Ooh, well. So put your answer in the chat, ocean full of jellyfish, or it would just be one forever. What do you think? Or I guess one until it died. Yeah. Well, I know what I was going to say, but I'm going to change it because of the nature of the way you asked the question. Do jellyfish clone themselves? What do you think? The Three Amigos says that they would reproduce. I'm seeing Micah saying an ocean full. Tinley says that it would live alone. I'm seeing a variety of answers, but most of the, our students in the chat are saying that you would have an ocean full of jellyfish. And in fact, with most species of jellyfish, that's what you would get. Jellyfish can usually do both asexual or sexual reproduction. And just one individual could lead to a whole ocean full of jellyfish. And this is because most cnidarians, that's the family of jellyfish, they can reproduce by cloning themselves. And it's not just cnidarians like this little hydra right here that can do it, so can starfish. But starfish have a really crazy strategy. If a starfish is injured and one of its arms comes off, the starfish can then regrow that arm. Oh. But even more amazing, that arm can grow a new starfish as well. <laughs> oh, that's so weird to think about. I mean, if I clipped my nails and a new math dad grew out of that, I mean, that'd be weird, kind of cool, but weird. It'd be crazy. Or what if you got a haircut and then you had a little army of mini yous that were following <laughs> you around? This is a crazy strategy that is not similar to what mammals can do, but pretty amazing. So called fragmentation. But that's not the only type of asexual reproduction. Bacteria reproduce by binary fission. That basically means they pinch themselves in half and create an exact replica. And here's a little video of E. coli dividing. You see, we start with just one bacterium, then we have two, and then four, and then eight. This is a really powerful reproductive strategy because organisms can grow so quickly. An entire population can explode when you started with just one individual. So if you see the timestamp on that, 300 minutes is all that it took to go from one E. coli to filling up that entire window. That's amazing. Yeah. And if you get sick with a bacterial infection, this is essentially what is happening. Problems are coming about because one bacteria becomes two bacteria and then those each 
multiply and then again and again, and it can lead to really fast growth. The last reproductive strategy I want to talk about is spore formation. And this one is kind of unique because it can be either an example of asexual reproduction or an example of sexual reproduction. Most of the time when you see a mushroom, this is an example of sexual reproduction where the spores that are being released are a little bit different than the fungus that produced them. But a lot of times spores are made as a way of cloning the organism. And the cool thing about spores is that they are kind of like seeds where they can lie dormant until the conditions are right. So when a fungus produces a whole bunch of spores, those spores can be dormant for years and not until it's the time to grow will they then wake up and start to live. Isn't that cool? That, that, that is way cool. So I just want to make sure I, I've got these terms down. So asexual reproduction is like the cloning, it's the <laughs> same genetic information yes. for the parent and the offspring, whereas sexual reproduction, then we're talking about shared genetic information being passed on. Yes. And let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of each approach right now, because if your goal is just to make more life, then there are advantages to asexual reproduction, such as you only need one individual. You don't have to find a partner. One E. coli can produce hundreds of E. coli. Nice and simple. And it's generally faster. If the conditions are good, it can take off really quick. But there's a big drawback. And the drawback is that you don't have genetic diversity. So that means if something comes along that can eat you, it's going to be able to eat all of you. And if something comes along that causes a disease, that disease is going to affect everyone mm -hmm. in the population. And this is why this strategy is not the most common strategy for, for animals and plants. The most common strategy is sexual reproduction because we have genetic diversity. And this is a huge advantage. You have less risk of disease and less risk of something wiping out an entire population. Potato blight is, if it, if it affects me, it's probably not going to affect someone else, or at least, yeah, w whatever detriment there could be, having a diversity is going to protect it's us going as to a help. species. Yeah, so think, for, for example, think of dogs. If there was a new virus that made dogs sick, it wouldn't make every single dog sick in the same way. Some dogs might get really sick, some might, dogs might not get sick at all. That's an advantage. But if there's a virus that infects bananas, it's going to make every single banana tree of the Cavendish variety mm. sick in the exact same way. And if that sickness is strong enough that the, the banana tree dies, then you have what happened with the Gros Michel banana in the 1950s, and you have to come up with a new variety. Another hypothetical question for you, Matt okay. Dad, and if you're watching live, I want you to answer in the chat. Let's do this same thought experiment, but with a rabbit instead. If you found a new planet, and this planet had lots of plants that were good to eat for rabbits, but it didn't have any animals on it at all. If you put one rabbit on the planet, would that one rabbit live their whole entire life alone? Or would that one rabbit turn into a population of rabbits that took over the planet? All right, I'm pretty confident on this one. Rabbits do not clone themselves, so this would be one lonely rabbit. And Barrett agrees with you, one lonely rabbit. Noel also alone. Renard and Rosalie say alone, lots of alones. It is actually a little bit of a trick question because it all depends on whether or not the rabbit's pregnant, right? Oh, it's true. <laughs> but true, if the rabbit is not pregnant and it's just a single rabbit, that rabbit would live alone the rest of its life. It cannot clone itself. So that's the main disadvantage of sexual reproduction. You need a partner to reproduce and it usually takes more time and energy. True. But, do you see this math, Dad? There's a little asterisk right there. Uh-oh, does that mean that there are exceptions to this? Let's play a short video clip. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. So in this video clip from the movie Jurassic Park, a character says, are you telling me that a population of females can reproduce? And then there's that famous quote, life finds, finds a, a way. way. 
in the fictional movie, that's what happened. A population of females reproduced and you had dinosaurs rampaging throughout the park. And that's a science fiction movie though, right? That is, but in real life, there was a Komodo dragon at a zoo. This Komodo dragon was female. This Komodo dragon had never lived in an enclosure with a male, ever. And she laid eggs and the eggs hatched. <gasps> what was happening? Magic. Not magic and not a sexual reproduction either. She was not cloning herself because the dragon, Komodo dragon was female. And then when the eggs hatched, all the eggs were male. This is called parthenogenesis, and it is a reproductive strategy that some reptiles can do, which is really cool and bizarre because it doesn't really fit those two categories that we just talked about, does it? Mm. Wow. So life finds a way. Indeed. Now we have a what's that critter mystery for you, and then some poll questions where you can test your knowledge and see how much you learned from this lesson. Okay. This is an endangered species. That's our first clue. Can you tell what this critter is? Type your guess into the chat and we'll see if I can stump you. Second clue. This animal oh. <laughs> had a internet browser named after them. The internet browser Firefox <laughs> was modeled after them. And I'm seeing our chat just completely fill up with red panda guesses. Good job, everyone. Closely related to raccoons. They are closely related to raccoons. It's a red panda. <laughs> Just from seeing the tail, you were able to figure that out. They were. I'm so impressed. <laughs> Give yourself a pat on the back if you guessed red panda, because that was very impressive, and you got it very quickly. It is poll time. Head over to itempool.com slash science mom slash live, and let's see how good of attention you've been paying. Okay, so... Our first question has to do with the advantages... Oh, or not. Oops, I... There we go. First question is back. It disappeared for a minute. Which of the following are advantages of sexual reproduction? Of, of asexual, asexual reproduction. Thank you. Sure. Only one parent is needed. The population can increase rapidly when the conditions are favorable. Genetic diversity is maximized. Or, and no energy is devoted to finding a mate. So only select the advantages of asexual reproduction. Kaladin, you're just so mellow. Just, he is. Just he's sitting there. He's pretty sure that more treats are on their way. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing three bars grow. There are. Although not all of the same length, so the level of confidence is not there. Only one parent is needed. The population can increase rapidly when the conditions are favorable. Genetic diversity is maximized, and no energy is devoted to finding a mate. Which of those are advantages to asexual reproduction? Let's go ahead and reveal our answer. Okay. And you are correct. So those, those three options A, B, and D work. Uh, but option C says genetic diversity is maximized. It is not. Genetic diversity is quite low with asexual reproduction. So that's the big drawback to that strategy. True or false? All living things are able to reproduce. Mm. What do you think, science puppy? He is here to cheer you on. <laughs> how, could you, how could they miss a question with a little Kaladin cheer? No. I would perform better. The answers on this one are a lot closer, Math Dad. It looked for a second like we were going to almost have a tie. Hmm. Yep, so can every living organism reproduce? You might want to think back to an example we talked about yesterday, and that's the only clue I'll give. Yesterday. Not yesterday. Last class. <laughs> the last class period. Ooh. Ooh, the chat seems a bit. I'm seeing up different in the answers air. in the chat too. All right. Oh, it's and tied. now it's tied. Oh my goodness. Mm. But I am seeing several people in the chat who were remembering that example we talked about. So let's go ahead and finish and reveal. Ooh, I love it when it's so close. And. Yes, Unbeatable Science Kids came in. It was close, but they conquered. And remember, mules was the comment I saw in the chat near at the end. So a mule is definitely alive, right? Right. It's a hybrid between a horse and a donkey, 
but it cannot reproduce. It is sterile. And we'll learn exactly why it's sterile in a future genetics lesson. My, my in first instinct on this one was, oh, it's got to be true. If it's alive, it needs to be able to reproduce, but it's... Not it was, everything. That's too, too simple, what I was thinking. Yeah, it is one of the defining characteristics of life, but you will find exceptions. What is the name of the form of reproduction where part of an organism is broken off and then grows into a genetically identical copy of the parent organism? Do we call that sexual reproduction, binary fission, vegetative propagation, spore formation, or fragmentation? <laughs> Were they listening? Hmm. I'm seeing well, no, we, we have a clear leader here. We do Although have there's a, clear a, leader. a second category getting some votes. <laughs> yeah. Y y usually a question can stump a few people, but not all of them. Oh. You had a treat on you. That's right. And the puppy attacked. I, I don't dare move. It's going to fall off. I've got to keep my shoulder in place. <laughs> Pressure's on. I think we have a clear favorite here, Math Dad. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer. Okay. The category receiving the most votes was option E, so fragmentation, and vegetative propagation was also correct. Is there a difference between those two? Vegetative propagation refers to plants. That's when you break off a piece of a plant and start a new plant, which is a clone of the first. And then fragmentation refers to animals, like with starfish or certain worms, where they can be cut into pieces and each piece grows a genetically identical copy. So nicely done. Okay, when one bacterium causes a person to become ill, the bacteria multiplied through asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. What's the best answer? And while this question is, is being answered, there was a good question I saw in the chat about carrots. Are carrots also clones just like potatoes are? And the answer is no. Carrots are almost always grown from seed. And that tuber, if you cut it up into new pieces, it's n each piece can't grow. Only the top part can. But here's something kind of cool about carrots. If you cut the top of a carrot off and it mm -hmm. has a little bit of green still and grows into a plant, it's not going to grow a whole new carrot. It's going to say, oh, I almost died. I better reproduce really fast and make as many seeds as possible. And mm -hmm. it will put all its energy into flowering. Well, that's cool. But potatoes... Those will grow into more. But you can't just cut up any part of the potato, right? It has to have the sprout on it. And in our, our Friday vi video that you'll find on Teachable, we have uh, instructions for you on how you can make your own potato clones. OK, they seem pretty confident that the answer is asexual reproduction, and th that is correct. Yeah, ba bacteria are pretty simple. And the more simple the organism, the more likely it is that they're using asexual reproduction. Very nice. And last question. What is the most important advantage of sexual reproduction? Multiple individuals are required for reproduction. One individual can reproduce and form a large population. High genetic diversity or low genetic diversity. So you're trying to identify the most important advantage of sexual reproduction. Hmm. There's a clear winner here, Math Dad. Look at how big that bar is. Yeah, okay. This means a victory is coming for the Unbeatable Science Kids, and I'm excited about this because I found confetti and a way for us to do a confetti celebration if all five questions are answered correctly. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched, science mom. Oh, I'm counting. Look at that. <laughs> 78 answers. All agree. That is a pretty big bar. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and finish and reveal. High genetic diversity is correct. That's right. So... Option A, multiple individuals are required for reproduction. That's true, but I, I don't know that I would count that as an, an advantage. Remember the, that one bunny on a new planet? Yeah, the one bunny can reproduce. Uh, All right, let's play the confetti. Woohoo! Good job, everybody! And now Math Dad also made a silly video just for you. Adelie penguins live along the Antarctic coast. To curry favor with a female, a male will present her with little rare rocks that line her nest. If she is suitably impressed, she will choose him as her mate. If she doesn't like the rock, then the male is out of luck.
Oh yeah. <laughs> that second rock was a pretty cool rock, and I like geology, so that wouldn't have been a bad approach. That's how to attract a science mom. <laughs> now, one of the questions that people had about reproduction throughout time has been how do certain traits get passed on? Because for having livestock or crops, you know, potatoes that are going to feed you, you really want to know how can you control the traits? And this was a mystery for hundreds of years with some ideas being somewhat correct and others being totally wrong until Gregor Mendel came up with an ingenious design for an experiment involving peas. And that's what we'll be covering in our next lesson, Mendel's Famous Experiments. Until then, work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you next time.